Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, add my thanks to Dean Alpern for his very gracious introduction. Um, it's a little um, humbling uh, to be introduced in such a personal way uh, by someone who's been a friend for so many years. And uh, I would modify uh, one statement that Joe made. I would say he, is, he was the best dean we've ever had. Um, not one of the best. Um, <laughs> And we miss him. Um, so um, I want to return to the, the question that Joe posed at the beginning, which is what is the normal function of ghrelin? Why is, it, why is this hormone conserved through fish and amphibians? Uh, and, um, and the reason that it's a puzzle is because the knockout animals, when people knocked out the gene for either ghrelin or the receptor in mice, there was essentially no effect on appetite or body weight or, um, uh, and, and very slight effects on metabolism. So why is this hormone so, so well conserved? So um, our approach to this, we began to be interested in this when we made um, goat knockout mice. Having uh, isolated and identified the enzyme that attaches ghrelin uh, to determine its relevance in vivo, um, we collaborated with uh, the Regeneron company uh, to uh, knock out the GOAT gene. And, and, the, and what you see here is the uh, knockout construct that the people at Regeneron made. And, uh, and it knocks out basically the whole gene. Um, and, and they sent us the embryonic stem cells and we made mice. And what you see here is that this is the level of goat messenger RNA in the stomach, and uh, it's basically undetectable in the knockout mouse, but ghrelin uh, is still expressed. And if one looks at plasma ghrelin levels in the knockout mice, um, they're uh, essentially undetectable. In wild-type mice, uh, the ghrelin rises with fasting, but in the knockout mice, they're not able to make any ghrelin. Now, ghrelin, as Joe said, when when we talk about, when we use the term ghrelin, we're talking about acylated ghrelin. But these goat knockout mice still make the desacyl form of ghrelin, and uh, if anything, that's elevated in the plasma of these mice. So we have mice now that have a total inability to make the active form of ghrelin. So what happens to their body weight? Well, here's the body weight of wild-type mice and uh, the goat knockout mice, either on a chow diet or on a um, high-fat diet. And you see that uh, both animals gain exactly the same amount of weight on a high-fat diet. So the, no the results with the goat knockout are the same as that other people had found with the ghrelin knockout, and that is that it doesn't seem to have any, uh, in it, it's, not, it's certainly not required in order for animals uh, to consume either normal food or uh, calorie-enriched food. So since ghrelin didn't have, seem to have anything to do with uh, body weight or um, metabolism, when animals are well-fed, then the question was, does, maybe we're asking the wrong question, and perhaps the, um, ghrelin is essential when animals are starved. So um, we be, began the studies that are outlined on this slide, and, and, and the way we do these studies is very important, so I'll go through it in some detail. So a postdoctoral fellow in our laboratory, Tong Jin Yang, um, uh, Tong Jin Zhao, um, does, takes mice and puts them in individual cages and then he measures their food intake for a week. So he knows how much each mouse eats every day. And then for each mouse in, individually, he reduces the food intake by 60%. So the, the mice now are only eating 40% of the food that they would normally eat. And it's, the, the mice are fed 40% of this intake for seven to nine days. And it's very important uh, for the studies that you understand that the daily regimen of these mice. The food is supplied at 6 p.m. each day, and the mice become ravenously hungry. So both the wild-type mice and the goat-minus mice eat 
their entire allotment of food within an hour. So at 6 o'clock, they basically get one meal. And then for the rest of the 24-hour period, they're, fa they're essentially fasting. And we measured their blood glucose at 5.30 p.m. the next day, which is 22 and a half hours after eating. So the mice are chronically calorie restricted, and then they essentially fast for uh, 24 hours. And, um, and when we look at the responses of the mice, first of all, in terms of body weight, both the wild type and the goat minus mice obviously lose weight on this diet. They lose about 30% of their body weight. But the weight reduction is the same in the goat minus and the, the uh, wild type. And they both lose the huge uh, majority of their fat mass. So our normal mice have about 8% body fat. And it's crucial to see that in order to see the metabolic responses that I'm going to show you, they have to lose uh, fat so that their body fat is reduced to 2%. So this is a very severe calorie restriction. It mim it's a mimic of, of a famine, essentially. And the animals uh, basically have almost no adipose tissue mass. So what happens to blood sugar? And that's where we got the first uh, indication of something important going on. In wild-type mice, when they're put on this calorie-restricted diet, and then the sugar is measured at 5.30 p.m., the blood sugar falls, but then it absolutely stabilizes over the next seven days. But in the goat not minus mice, the initial fall is the same, but they never stabilize. And each day, the, the blood sugar is progressively lower, so that by the seventh day, the blood sugar is somewhere between 10 and 20 milligrams per deciliter. And all of you should know that that's basically not compatible with life. The animals become uh, almost um, moribund, and they have to be sacrificed. So it looks like uh, goat ghrelin is necessary in order to maintain the blood sugar during this, these times of, of uh, severe calorie restriction. Now, what's even more interesting is the daily pattern of blood sugar in these animals. So now you're looking at animals that have been calorie restricted for a week. When we and remember, they were fed the previous uh, night at 6, at 6 p.m. So now, 15 hours later, at 9 o'clock in the morning, the animals, the knockout animals and the wild type animals have the same blood sugar. But then, during the day, when there is really no more food left, the wild type animals are able to maintain their blood sugar, but the goat minus animals decline progressively during the day. And then when they're fed at 6 o'clock, immediately within two hours, their um, blood sugar goes back to normal. Now, if you look at the plasma ghrelin level, in wild-type mice, the ghrelin level starts out relatively low. And as, the, as they go through the day without food, their ghrelin level goes to really astronomical. Uh, these are very high ghrelin levels. And then again, as soon as they're fed, uh, the, the uh, ghrelin goes down. Of course, the knockout animals can't make any ghrelin, so they have uh, no ghrelin during the day. But their desacyl ghrelin levels uh, parallel that of the wild-type animals. So the knockouts can make the desacyl ghrelin, but they can't acylate it. Now, this is the important part of this. If you look at the plasma growth hormone level, remember, ghrelin releases growth hormone. And when ghrelin goes up in the wild-type animals, growth hormone levels climb uh, dramatically. And when they're fed, ghrelin comes down, and growth hormone immediately comes down. So there's a correlation between the rise in plasma ghrelin and the rise in uh, growth hormone. Now the question is, uh, is this some effect of uh, specific effect of the goat knockout? Um, would, is it really a loss of ghrelin? So we obtained some mice that were knocked out, not in goat, but in ghrelin itself. These are pre-pro-ghrelin knockout mice. And the response is exactly the same. Here's a, these are pre-pro-ghrelin knockout mice, so they can't make any ghrelin. They've been calorie restricted for seven days. And you see that during the day, their blood sugar falls, just like uh, the goat knockout. And it's restored by food. 
Uh, of course, these ghrelin knockout mice can't show the increase in plasma ghrelin, and these mice can't make, the ghrelin knockout mice can't make desacyl ghrelin either, uh, and so they have no desacyl ghrelin. And again, the growth hormone uh, response doesn't occur uh, if you don't have ghrelin. So um, it looks like um, ghrelin uh, is necessary in order to maintain the blood sugar. Now the question is, why does the blood sugar fall during the day in the ghrelin knockout mice? So uh, recently we've measured the plasma lactate level. So the major substrate for glucose production in the liver is lactate, which is generated in muscle. And what you can see here is that in the goat knockout animals, uh, progressively during the day, the plasma lactate level falls, and then it's restored as soon as they eat. And the same is true for plasma pyruvate, which is in equilibrium with the lactate. So um, the major substrate for gluconeogenesis is falling in these animals during the day. And of course, being starved, they, these animals basically have no glucagon, I mean no insulin, so the insulin level is, is uh, essentially undetectable in all of these mice during the day, and it goes up uh, in response to feeding. The interesting thing is glucagon. It, it, the, so these mice are hypoglycemic, they have low blood sugar, uh, and they're responding to that by raising glucagon, which is the, the, enzo, the hormone that should stimulate glucose production in the liver. And in fact, there's no problem with glucagon. The, the, um, the knockout mice have just as high glucagon as the wild type mice, but we believe that the glucagon is ineffective because there's no substrate in the form of lactate and pyruvate. And, um, this is, these are very recent studies, but the first, what we decided was, well, if this is true, then if we simply give these animals lactate back, uh, we should be able to restore the blood sugar. So this is the experiment that was done. Uh, again, this is the, the knock, the, these are all knockout mice, and they were uh, uh, calorie restricted for seven days, and then followed during the day, and here's the blood sugar, and you see if the animals were just given saline injections, the blood sugar declined, but if, we, if they injected lactate at these different time points, uh, the blood sugar was restored. So we're now going on the hypothesis that the problem in these mice is that the, their muscle is not uh, producing lactate. And, um, and our hypothesis is that the, the muscle is actually, instead of undergoing glycolysis and releasing the lactate, that in the absence of growth hormone, um, the muscle is converting, uh, is taking the pyruvate that it makes and going through the mitochondria and using oxidative metabolism and oxidizing the, um, the glucose without um, releasing lactate. So that is, uh, and somehow growth hormone is regulating that. Now, why do we think that it's growth hormone that's doing the regulation? Well, let me show you how uh, we uh, demonstrated that. So um, what we were able to do is to take an osmotic mini pump and uh, fill it with either ghrelin or growth hormone. And then, and we implanted this uh, mini pump um, three days before we started the calorie restriction so that we were able to maintain ghrelin levels um, at high levels during the calorie restriction uh, time. And um, this shows the results. Um, in wild type mice, the blood sugar was stabilized uh, and the increased ghrelin didn't make any difference. However, in the goat knockout mice, the uh, blood sugar fell but when they were infused with ghrelin, that fall in blood sugar was, was prevented. 
What you see here is the growth hormone levels. In wild-type mice, the growth hormone was very high. Remember, this is measured at 5.30 in the afternoon. The, the, the growth hormone level was very high, and there wasn't much further increase with ghrelin. In the knockout mice, growth hormone was low, but the ghrelin infusion uh, allowed it to rise. So the hypothesis is that the actual active principle here is growth hormone. So to test that, instead of um, infusing uh, ghrelin, we infused growth hormone. And this shows that we got the same result when we, when we infused growth hormone through the mini pump. Here's the knockout mice, their blood sugar is declining uh, uh, during the uh, fasting period, and it's restored uh, it, uh, when they are receiving growth hormone. These are the plasma growth hormone levels. And again, we gave enough so that in wild-type mice, the growth hormone uh, was, ele was elevated, and in the knockout mice, we, uh, uh, we got the same growth hormone levels as we did in the, in the wild-type. So uh, from this, uh, we conclude that the, um, the action of ghrelin in maintaining blood sugar during periods of famine is due to the ability of ghrelin to release growth hormone under those conditions, and under those conditions, it's the growth hormone that's maintaining uh, the blood sugar. Now, the question that Professor uh, Lipton asked is, uh, uh, is, how to, is what is the signal that turns on uh, ghrelin secretion? And uh, my esteemed colleague, answered by saying we don't know. And he's right in the sense that we don't know what happens during, um, the, during the daily diurnal cycle. But we think we do know uh, what happens um, during what, why um, ghrelin is released um, at, during this time of fasting. And let me show you uh, the data there. So to, to try to figure out what it is, what is the signal that's stimulating ghrelin release, it's a difficult problem because, um, as shown on this slide, ghrelin is only made in a very few cells in the gastric mucosa. And, um, and GOAT is, is present in the same cells. But to study the, secre the regulation of secretion in this very small population is difficult. So to get around that problem, we decided to try to, uh, and, to, and to be able to work with isolated cells <coughs> we decided to try to make ghrelinomas, to try to make um, tumors that would be ghrelin-secreting tumors. So to do that, we used a technique that has uh, been um, pioneered by uh, Doug Hanahan and many others. We, we took the uh, pre-pro-ghrelin gene, and we introduced the coding region for the SV40T antigen uh, and, and oncogene in order to convert the ghrelin cells into tumor cells. And this shows the stomach of a wild-type mouse, and this shows the stomach of a mouse that's expressing SV40T antigen in the ghrelin-producing cells. So these mice develop ghrelinomas. And um, you can tell that by measuring the plasma ghrelin level. So this is one of the transgenic SV40T antigen mice. And, or, or, or the, or actually an average of 17 of these mice, and what you see is this progressive, massive increase in plasma ghrelin uh, as these ghrelinomas develop and start secreting uh, ghrelin. Um, we um, were then able to take these mice, these tumors, dissociate the cells, and convert them into cell lines that we could maintain in cell culture and therefore study the regulation of ghrelin secretion in these um, cultured cell lines. And here you see an experiment in which we tested a whole bunch of potential regulators of ghrelin secretion in these isolated ghrelinoma cells. By the way, I have to explain why we call these PG1 cells. These, these cells the, the mice actually develop tumors in the pancreas as well as in the stomach because the pancreas also has some ghrelin-secreting cells. Um, 
And the first cell lines that we made came from the pancreatic tumors. So these, are, these cells are from the pancreatic tumors, but we get the same result uh, from the stomach tumors. So we added these various hormones, and it turns out that the only one of the ones that we studied, all of them at super saturating levels, the only one that had a, a, a significant effect on ghrelin secretion was norepinephrine. And um, so now for the first time in our 40-year career, we're wandering into Bob Lepkowitz's territory. <laughs> uh, and um, what we found was that if we, that we could stimulate secretion in these cells not only with epinephrine, but with norepinephrine. And in fact, that norepinephrine was, had a slightly higher uh, affinity ability to do this. And of course, forskolin, which is the activator of adenylate cyclase, uh, reproduced the effect of these adrenergic hormones. On the other hand, beta adrener, I mean, on the other hand, um, uh, analogs of acetylcholine, cholinergic agents, uh, did not uh, cause any uh, stimulation. And um, these are the, the norepinephrine was working at 0.1 micromolar and uh, epinephrine at 0.6 micromolar. And the slightly higher affinity for norepinephrine uh, suggests that um, the, that the, um, that the, the receptor that's being activated is the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. And in order to test that possibility, we used a specific beta-1 antagonist, atenolol, and that blocked this secretion, whereas a beta-2 antagonist, the beta-2 subtype of the beta adrenergic receptor, had no effect. So um, we believe that the um, adrenergic agents are working through the beta-1 adrenergic um, receptor. And um, to test that in intact mice, we took two approaches. One is that we depleted catecholamines from sympathetic nerve, nerve endings by use of the drug reserpine. Reserpine prevents the reuptake of catecholamines in sympathetic uh, neurons and therefore uh, leads to depletion of catecholamines from sympathetic neurons. And um, in fact, so in, uh, when we looked at plasma ghrelin levels in uh, animals that were treated only with vehicle, this was the ghrelin level in the fed state, and it went up when the animals were fasted. This was only a 24-hour fast. And, um, but when the animals were reserpinized and, and uh, their catecholamines were depleted, they, that increase was prevented. And um, we could get the same effect not by depleting all catecholamines, but just by blocking the beta-1 receptor with atenolol, it prevented this increase during fasting, um, whereas the, uh, the beta-2 uh, antagonist did not. So, um, so we believe, therefore, that this is the, the, the metabolic response to chronic starvation. Starvation causes a fall in blood glucose. There's a lot of information about glucose-sensing neurons in the brain, both in the, in the brain itself and in, and in, the, uh, in the hypothalamus. Uh, but it's not really clear uh, what they, how these neurons work and what pathways they uh, affect. But somehow, the hypoglycemia uh, leads to activation of the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic neurons in the stomach release norepinephrine locally, uh, and that binds to the beta-1 receptor. That stimulates the release of ghrelin. Ghrelin goes to the hypothalamus, and the pituitary leads to the production of growth hormone, which then uh, restores the, the blood glucose and leads to survival. And when this pathway is disrupted through by in an animal that can't make ghrelin, uh, the blood sugar continues to fall. and this comp compensatory mechanism uh, does not occur. So we believe that the answer to the ghrelin puzzle, how do we get to there? Oh, we're starting from the beginning. Should we start all over again? <laughs> Just a quick review. I 
guess, I guess there's no way, no way I can get it back. This is an irre irreversible thing. But anyway, we believe, unfortunately, we lost our colleagues, too, at the, the last slide. But um, the fact is that um, we believe that the reason ghrelin has been conserved in evolution since amphibians, I mean, when you think about it, the, the problem for survival is not too much food. That's, that's a characteristic, you know, that's never happened until uh, very recently. Uh, but there is, all animal species are constantly threatened by starvation. Every, every species has gone through uh, selection based on survival uh, during periods of famine. We believe that, the, uh, that ghrelin is essential to um, uh, maintaining the blood sugar during periods of severe famine, and that's what its essential function is. Um, it's very interesting that in humans, um, the highest levels of, of ghrelin are measured in people with anorexia nervosa. These are people who um, are essentially dying of starvation. They have very high levels of ghrelin in their blood, and they also have very high levels of growth hormone. And we believe it's the growth hormone that's maintaining their blood sugar during uh, these, the period of severe um, weight loss and malnutrition. And um, it is true that uh, about 15% of people with anorexia will die of hypoglycemia. Uh, and we believe that's probably because um, you know, there's a point at which even the ghrelin and growth hormone can't maintain your blood sugar. Can we get back to no, to the, I'm going to get back to the, to the end of the right. I don't know how much further. I'll go all the way. Okay. Um, so, um, quick review. Uh, so that's what we believe. That it, this, Joe doesn't like me to use the saying we believe. He says it sounds like an evangelical preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Joe grew up in the South, and so he, I, you know, he, he's more sensitive to it than I am. But uh, we hypothesize, <laughs> as scientists. Uh, uh, so there's the anorexia nervosa, and and we believe we uh, hypothesize <laughs> that anorexia nervosa uh, people are being kept alive by their ghrelin. Um, and the question that we're trying to answer now is how does, how does it work? How does the growth hormone maintain the blood glucose, glucose level during starvation? Um, endocrinologists, by the way, know that um, in uh, infants who are born with primary growth hormone deficiency, one of the big problems is uh, neonatal hypoglycemia. Um, so it's clear that we need growth hormone to maintain our blood sugar. Uh, and, um, and the question is, how does it work? And as I showed you, we believe that it has something to do with actions of growth hormone on muscle that lead to the generation of lactate, uh, which can then be used in, in the classical Cori cycle uh, to regenerate uh, glucose in the uh, liver. Um, now that we're here, I can point out uh, the graduate student that Joe mentioned, Jing Yang, the one who persisted, who <laughs> who spent another six months cloning the last, the 16th one of these M-boats after the first 15 had failed. And in a situation where he didn't even know that the assay, you know, that the cell line that he was transfecting these, we had no evidence that they would actually be able to use the goat enzyme even if it was put in there. And it failed 15 times. And, and then he couldn't get the 16th one, so he kept working at it for six months and pieced it all together. I'm saying this for the students in the audience. You know, persistence pays. Uh, don't give up. Uh, and I'd like to call other special attention to another uh, uh, student from China, Tang Jin Zhao, who um, uh, worked out this elaborate protocol for um, chronic starvation um, in, in mice and is, and is a fantastic uh, animal experimentalist. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you and thank Dr. Alpern for inviting us, and I'll be happy to answer questions.